good afternoon, all. My name is Tony Meyer. Uh, I'm a gallerist here. And uh, the topic today is food, art, and design, and the intersection. Uh, we have some of the most talented individuals on the stage next to me. Uh, we have Rosanna Castrillo Diaz, an artist who has lived here since 2002, uh, has a retrospective at the gallery now through the end of February, uh, and uh, is uh, amazingly collected by San Francisco Museum with, I think, seven or eight examples. Uh, just an incredible talent, and uh, by all standards, a, a permanent resident of, of California. Uh, to her left, uh, Corey Lee, uh, longtime resident as well, uh, incredible restaurateur, chef. His uh, restaurants range from Bennu, opened 10 years ago, three Michelin stars, um, the Monsieur Benjamin in the Hayes Valley, uh, in situ at San Francisco Museum of Modern Art with a beautiful Rosanna on the wall. And lastly, to be open this summer, uh, St. Ho Wan, um, a new restaurant. And to my right, uh, we have Sam Hamilton, another longtime resident, with probably the most bespoke and uh, curated shop, and my favorite in the entire world, called Marsh on Sacramento Street. Uh, been open since 2003, and uh, a, a range of household items and more, but uh, a, a must, must, must see. With this intersection that we're talking about tonight, or today, uh, I wanted to identify the, the artist, the restaurateur, and uh, the two commercial folks here uh, as people in the service business. And that there really are not many differences with what we all do, except the takeaway that the audience uh, leaves with after they uh, enjoy their time with us. My question to my fellow panelists here is how the art world influences your own craft and business, and what inspiration drives you in your creative journey? And I think I'll start with Sam to my right. Fair warning, I am not a great public speaker, so, so bear with me, bear with me. Um, I would say that for me, the art world is incredibly um, relevant in terms of how I create a space because Yes, I'm in the service business. I'm supposed to let this follow me as I turn my head. Um, yes, I am indeed in the service business. You can buy anything that's in my shop. But at the end of the day, what I really aim to do is have people who come into March have an experience. And whether you buy anything or not is actually not the thing that, that makes my heart sing, is that you can see my hand and the delight of your eye as you look at all of the kinds of things, the sculptures, the utilitarian pieces, the kitchen equipment, high and low, and, and love them as much as I do and have a moment. Um, it's, it's somewhat theater combined with business or service. Um, and it's a delight for me and it's a delight for me to interact with the public in my space. I think one thing that differentiates these three is the, the clarity with which they demonstrate their talents and craft. And whether one actually likes what they see or takes something away as a consumer might, uh, the idea is that the statement is made with absolute uh, clarity, but, but a, a, a level that uh, is bespoke to what they do. So a craft unlike one an another. And uh, with that in mind, the experiences that you may enjoy at Corey's restaurant, I will turn it over to him. Thank you. Um, I think for me, it, the art world really helps me um, uh, calibrate what we're trying to achieve in our restaurants or in the dining experience that we're offering. Um, I think ultimately um, you get inspired by art or evoke some kind of um, emotion. And if we can um, use that as an example, for something that we aspire to achieve. Um, I think that's the strongest influence that, that I have with art. There was a wonderful evening at, at uh, in situ uh, a few months ago uh, that was an invitation by Corey to Rosanna uh, as a food journey uh, related to where she comes from. 
and uh, what she does as an artist. And the, the, the blend, the blur, the lack of boundaries with what we all do, I think is a, uh, an, an enormous point as aesthetics uh, inspire everything and everything inspires aesthetics. Um, I think, Rosanna, if you don't mind talking a little bit about that dinner, that would be an interesting story for people to hear. Hello. <laughs> I lost my voice. So I hope I can make myself clear. Um, it was such a pleasure to say yes to Corey when he said, let's do an artist dinner and let's see what we can do. And um, um, it, took, it took seconds for me to say yes. And then I realized, what have I gotten myself into? Um, the team came to my studio to look at my work and see how they couldn't get inspired by it. And I had a lot of conversations with them. I brought them home to, to try my food, the food that I have uh, grown up eating in northern Spain, in Asturias. And, um, and from there on, there was a great conversation, great collaboration. And I have to say that um, when the food was all said and done, we were talking about how to place it on the table and how to, I mean, I didn't know about you at the time or I would have brought you in. <laughs> but um, Corey was exceptional. I mean, um, he went the full length in terms of the aesthetics of what went on the table. Um, they created a cracker that looked like a piece of coal. I come from a mining town. And, um, and it was uh, done with ink squid, uh, um, I mean squid ink. And uh, we put it in an easel and the easel happened to be too small, so they got another one that was too big, and then everything that went on the table was um, really thought, really, really thought uh, through, and it looks so beautiful, and uh, things sometimes were so interesting, we kept telling people, um, make sure you don't eat this, because we had charcoal, we had uh, some other things on the table that looked like art, or like looked like food, but they were actually like gorgeous, uh, napkins that were in the shape of a little pill that would explode into a napkin and you know we were afraid people would be eating all these things so it was it was so much fun it was really so I, it just um it gave me an insight of uh to the extent that this um this level of cuisine um pays attention to aesthetics and perfection and it was amazing the common bond uh, with these three is the uh, aspect and opportunity of experiential and uh, Corey's cooking, Sam's store, and Rosanna's artworks. And panelists, in terms of your travels uh, within town, outside of town, uh, are there specific uh, moments, artworks, or foods, uh, or beverages that have inspired uh, an effort in terms of the work you've produced or the work that you've bought for your store or obviously menu ads that you've put forth? Corey? Yeah, um, I, can, I can start. Um, I think uh, travel has been a great source of inspiration. Um, I think uh, definitely kind of earlier on in my career, the travel is more about trying different foods and going to different restaurants and experiencing things or taste specifically related to food. That was very inspiring. But I think the inspiration can be from anything, um, completely unrelated to food. And just because I'm a chef, that inspiration um, is applied to cooking and it materializes in food. Um, but I'm sure you know, anyone who has um, any kind of creative endeavor is inspired by things outside of their specific um, uh, profession. Um, but you apply it in your own way. And so for me, it can be something um, as broad or as different as, uh, as a landscape. Uh, I was recently, just a couple, a couple weeks ago, in, um, in Iceland. And, and just the landscape is, is so powerful there. Um, and seeing that, you know, I saw something that's very monochromatic on a plate. Um, and that can translate to a dish, although it's kind of unrelated to food. So it's not really about going somewhere or trying a dish and be like, oh, I can do a variation of that. Um, so yeah, I think, I think travel is a big part of that. 
Sam, as you've traveled with the family and uh, across the, the country and going south, east, west, and north, have there been specific uh, visits or experiences artistically or with food that have inspired purchases for the store or s themes you wanted to put out for? Um, multiple times. I mean, just in the... Uh, Tony and I sit on the board for the Chinati Foundation and Marfa, and one of the thing that, things that has always struck me as as rigid as Donald Judd feels, um, when you go into his spaces and there are beds and there is cooking equipment and there, you feel the intimacy of a life living as an artist in space with, with the dailiness of life as well as the um, pristine quality of his artwork. Um, but also, um, years ago, I participated in um, a DIFA event, a, design, a table design event, and um, my business partner, Mark Cunningham, and I designed it to feel like Brancusi's studio that you can go visit in, at the, in the courtyard of the Pompidou, and it's always struck me because you really feel the resonance of this artist, but it's something that is some, it comes to me all of the time, thinking about Brancusi's space and him as a person. And so, yeah, I, I'm, and even um, we went to the artist studio, the Madu in um, Long Island, much more feeling like Bloomsbury and filled with color and life and just completely quirky and unexpected. And that also floats into both the, the food product that I sell at the store, but also the art that I show and, the um, pieces that I carry. So yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, travel definitely is a great inspiration. And Marfa, of course. Um, I want to think that Donald Judge um, studio home and his New York apartment were a little messier when he was there than they are right now. Because, uh, <laughs> because I, I kind of aspire to, to have the studio that he has. Uh, but uh, mine is a little <laughs> more filled with <laughs> the day today. Um, I have to say that I find a lot of inspiration in what surrounds me um, in my day to day and even in the studio, uh, whether it is a, a group of flowers that I buy um, and they begin to wilt or even a piece of scotch tape that is on the wall that was the beginning of the scotch tape sculptures that I did. So um, everything is up for grabs, you know, in San Francisco, in the studio, and yeah, around in the world. Yeah, I mean, back to the experiential experience, uh, you know, what's outside these doors, the art fair, it's a, it's, it is absolutely paramount to actually use your eyes, look. If the gallery will let you touch, you can touch. Uh, but the idea of seeing these things in the flesh. And when you talk to burgeoning artists, uh, undergrad or graduate, uh, it's important to ask them, what was the surface like? Uh, did the Agnes Martin painting have bumps on it? Uh, did the textile have frays to it? And uh, without actually seeing these things versus the easy uh, screen read and having seen an exhibit and a minute and 32 seconds uh, as you go online, it is paramount to actually get out there and see these things. And uh, beyond the commerce of, of what we all do, uh, the sensory opportunities of the artist, the restaurateur, and the shopkeeper uh, is something that uh, can never be replicated via the internet or by hearsay. And uh, the description of a meal or of a drawing or of a stove is something that can only be f known firsthand. And uh, you know, the onus is on you, the audience, and the viewers, but uh, without actually touching, feeling, and smelling, uh, this stuff is somewhat uh, soulless. Uh, and um, when somebody says they've eaten at your restaurant, I, I'm always curious if you actually ask them what they ate and if they can remember. Uh, and uh, obviously seeing an exhibition of yours, Rosanna, and citing a work which was their favorite, or going to your store and saying what they saw, or the color of the stove that was in the shop, <clears throat> what have you. Uh, and uh, without uh, uh, embarrassing someone, I'm wondering if you have any experiences 
where either you lost an opportunity to experience something by missing it, or actually gain something and infuse that experience into something you all did. Rosanna? Well, I, I, just, I would like to talk about Nancy White's opening last night. Hi, Nancy. Um, that is an experience you have to see. Nancy's paintings cannot be replicated by a photograph. Uh, the texture, the warmth. Um, uh, you need to see my drawings in person, no matter how well they're photographed. Um, and um, I, I don't know what I've missed, Tony, but I know how much I'm taking in from others. And uh, and one example was last night and Nancy's uh, opening. Um, it's it's uh, exquisite. And like your store, like your food, um, these are mm, great moments to experience. I mean, I feel like I miss out on things all the time. <laughs> um, you know, but I, I, I did, you know, your point about um, actually seeing something in the flesh really resonates with me because um, I think right now we live in a world, in, in, in my world anyway, where you know, food is shared so much through images, and that's. There's just not a way you can experience um, you know, what food is. Um, and then just thinking about Rosanna's piece that's inside of our restaurant, inside the SF MoMA. Um, you know, I'm lucky enough to see that regularly over, over years. Um, and even now, every, every time I go in, you can't help but take notice of that and stop and look. Um, and really, if you haven't seen it, everyone should I mean, forget, the, forget about the restaurant. You should just come in and, <laughs> and, and see it. Um, and it changes throughout the day. Uh, with the light, and it also changes depending on your mood. Um, so I think it's important to not only see it in the flesh, but have these things be part of your life. Um, and I think it's, I think art experiences are much more rewarding when it's when it's like that. Um, again, I can also say I don't know what I've missed, but I'm sure I've missed plenty. Um, I can't regret it because what I don't know, I don't know. Exactly. But I will say, if I, I'm very proud of the website that we have, but if I could only have a website, I would not have March. I have very, I mean, I'm happy to have it be a part of the retail experience that I have, but it is not, that's not what makes my heart sing. And I think that the thing that I, I feel, um, the intimacy of, eating and having an experience around you and the attention to detail that I, I feel like is something that the three of us share, that it's an honor for us to try and cultivate an experience for the people who are in our spaces. And, um, and it's, it's fun. It's kind of creating magic and also looking at art at several times a day. There's an amazing, um, Irwin installation in Marfa, and it's all about seeing it multiple times during the day. And I feel like people's mood changes multiple times during the day. So your life experience is something that is very much a part of what I do and what I love and what drives me. With the lack of boundaries that exist with these sectors and many, many others, how do you incorporate or combat the high-low? Uh, both as to high culture, low culture, and sadly the, the, the price points that often are associated with either an entry fee or if you're trying to acquire something or eat at a restaurant. Uh, uh, one's vision is paramount, but at, 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 at certain points, obviously, it limits the audience based on affordability. And that's one of the great things about museum exhibitions or gallery exhibitions or Art fairs beyond the entrance fee is the chance to see it all. Uh, don't need to take it home necessarily. But how do you three, uh, I mean, combat is really the word uh, because it gets more expensive to do what we all do. Um, and obviously you want to spread the information and the viewing and experiential opportunity uh, to as many as you can. Sam? Um, I think there's a perceived notion that everything that I sell at March is at a very exclusive elite price point. And, and actually, it's, we go pretty, we go high and low. And, and um, not just because I want anybody to be able to buy a Oaxaca glass for $8, um, 
but because I think that's the way I live. I like to eat off of the most beautiful piece of china I might have in my cabinet and just be having cereal out of it and enjoy it, not just at Thanksgiving. And I also like to be able to say, this is a fabulous teapot and it's ubiquitous. I can get it at Conrad's, I can get it at March, and that's okay too. I feel like there's, um, there's beauty in all levels of things. And, um, and I, I think it's really important to just sort of address it in that way and, and experience it in that way. I think, I think that's a, a really big challenge, actually. And um, we struggle with it all the time. I mean, I've been, I've been working in, in restaurants for, I mean, exp you know, expensive restaurants for, for 25 years. And uh, I still haven't really figured out how to do that. Um, it's, it's particularly challenging for, for me because people can compare a dining experience or just having food um, with another one and compare the price points. So we don't, you know, I'm not involved, or I don't engage in a, in a pure art form like Rosanna where um, you can't compare her work and the value of that to something else. But you can compare the cost of a dinner where you, you, know, you had this, this, and that to another dinner where you had something similar and um, there's a value assessment there. Um, so it is re it's, really, it's really tough. And I think f um, in some ways, uh, because uh, at Benu anyway, I think the restaurant is, 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 qu is quite an expensive restaurant. Um, maybe it, it reaches a certain price point where that value assessment is, is taken away because of that. Um, I, think there, um, I think when anyone decides to spend you know, hours dining, dining somewhere, having you know, 20 plus items. It's a commitment. Yeah, it's, it's a commitment, but you, you realize you're engaging in something that's not just about getting full uh, and being satiated. And I think the price point actually um, influences that. So if we were to lower our price point, let's say, one, I mean, we go out of business, but at the same time, I think that might actually make people um, question the value more because they're still in that box of comparing it to a normal meal. Yeah, the most interesting thing, though, is you you control the tempo. So everybody else on stage, you can do a drive-by experience, whether you buy something or not at an exhibition of Rosanna's or at, at Sam's store. And obviously, your audience is locked into their experience based on the, the cadence or the tempo at which you serve it, which uh, is great because you set the tone. I mean, you can put a value to the cost of the materials and and whatnot, but you can't really um, put a value to um, how you feel about something, right? Um, and that's what's, I think, consistent here. If you're living with a beautiful object and you get to see that and eat off that every day, what is the value of that? It's, it's far beyond the cost of the porcelain or the cost of the wood or whatever material you used. Um, and I think that's kind of you know, the trade that we're in. It's the feel good. But I would also say that, I mean, it kind of reminds me of the film Babette's Feast that you're eating you, you're there for the experience. So that meal might cost a billion dollars, but you are, that is your whole night. That is a moment in time that you'll never forget. If that, I mean, that's what you're trying to achieve. It's pretty special. I would like to, I would like to speak about in situ because one of the things I liked about in situ was that you can go there and just try um, plates from the best chefs in the world um, at a decent price. You, you don't need to go and buy an entire dinner. But you can say, you know, I'm just going to go there and get this person's plate. And I think that's a very generous way of, like, sharing food, you know? Because other than, I don't know, um, going to France and going to Spain and going to one of these restaurants, and commit into a 20 course meal, you can just have one plate by a fantastic chef, three star chef, and then go back home and you had a little bit of that, you know, at least the food, maybe not the entire experience. Yeah, w so, uh, yeah I wish I wish me. I just recorded that. But, uh, <laughs> um. No, but, but also the fact that part of the restaurant you cannot um, reserve. So anybody can walk in and partake of that experience. That's just a very, uh, you know, it's a good, uh, um, democratic kind of way of presenting food. 
you're, cur you're curating the experience. And I think you all actually curate the experience as soon as you step into the visual experience of tasting, touching, or, or looking. And uh, it, it's a time thing that obviously is more controlled in a sit-down experience at a restaurant, but otherwise, you're, you're taking them on a journey which hopefully is an endless uh, takeaway that you get to bring home, whether you buy the object or not, but it's in your memory and uh, locked in, hopefully forever. Well, I, uh, I was kind of answering your question from the perspective of um, where I spend most of my time, which is Bennu. But um, and I'm glad Rosanna just reminded me because I think that's something that we talked quite a bit about when we were opening in situ. And you know, I, I really have to thank the museum for, for their support of such a wild concept. And it, it is a very different restaurant. Um, we're taking these works out of, out of context and, and offering a single dish from this restaurant um, that offers a whole experience. Um, but that's also what um, I think I was kind of alluding to earlier, where food is not something you can share with images or stories. You actually, you actually have to consume this and taste it. And how do you do that? You know, how can someone taste um, something from a restaurant that, that charges hundreds of dollars and is, is thousands of miles away? It's, it's not accessible. Um, and in the spirit of what museums offer, um, that's what the program at, a, at that restaurant was about. Um, similarly, you know, Sam's store, maybe you can't outfit your entire kitchen with things from her store, but if you have this beautiful single object um, that you can interact with um, daily, you know, I think that's, that's rewarding and, and you know, it makes life a little better. And, and Extremely. Yeah, so seeing, and that's what museums offer, I think seeing maybe you can't buy one of Rosanna's pieces or, or, you know, um, or see it daily, but you can go to a museum and, and, and see it. Um, and it's the access, I think that's important too. For the next generation of panelists, 20 years from now, sitting up here, I'm sure you're all uh, questioned. How do you do it? What should I do? Where should I go? How do I begin? Uh, what what pearls of wisdom would you bestow upon uh, uh, the, the youth of the world, asking to try and emulate your journey, or simply get involved uh, as an artist, as a chef? Uh, and as a, a store owner, Sam? Um, well, it's uh, what pearls of wisdom. I don't, I wouldn't, I don't want to put it in that, <laughs> that um, mode, but I would say follow your bliss. And so if you're, if you, and owning a store is not for the faint of heart. It is a lot of work. You have to re-merchandise, you have to buy, you have to think about concepts. If you're, in terms of the kind of store that it's, that's not like a five and dime or something along those lines. So it's a real labor of love and you have to want to do it. Um, I studied art history um, in college and then worked for Ralph Lauren for a dozen years. and. Creating a sense of wonder for me, working very closely with Ralph was kind of an extraordinary experience for me. And because it wasn't about the product, it was about the world. And um, it really fostered for me just a love. I always had a love of beauty, but it, um, it narrowed my lens and um, it was incredibly helpful for me. Uh, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Your term, follow your bliss, is excellent. My question would be specific. In year five, following your bliss, or coming home at 2 a.m., uh, was the idea of uh, sole proprietorship uh, obvious, or was it eventual? Um, it was obvious to me early on. I just didn't know how it was going to get there, but... Um, it, working for Ralph, you actually are working, you're designing toward, to the person. It was very specifically for one person. And I have, I'm a real director of opinions. I have a lot of them. And <laughs> so um, I knew I was going to have to do my own thing. And I didn't know how big or small it was going to be. And I, I still don't know how big or small it's going to be. It, it, we are where we are right now. And I'm able to do what, what really energizes me. Thank you. Rosanna? Um, I had the same answer in mind. I, see, uh, I think that um, just be authentic. Just, um, 
if you're lucky, um, you will find out what really motivates you. Um, and I find that people often come full circle. Um, I started as a very young child working in pencil. Forget color. I don't know. I was, I was not coloring. I was just drawing. Um, so, um, I, you know, I did, you, you can imagine everything throughout my years of schooling, you know, painting, ceramics, anything, and sculpture. And then at some point, uh, somebody pointed that I was painting like if, like if I were drawing. So my paintings had a lot of lines, and it was, I was trying to use the brush as a pencil. And all of a sudden it was like, oh, oh of course. Yeah. So um, even though I do more than drawing, I think that um, just coming back to your full self, to your authentic self, um, and you'll have revelations um, uh, throughout life. It's what's going to pull you through. But that epiphany, was that what catapulted you to come to the States? Was that took you no, on to more this schooling? Was, this was in the States. I, it was before I applied to my MFA at Mills. And I was in Boston. And I did one year of what they call post back, which is, uh, I think, is a money-making enterprise for schools. But aside from that, I was able to do anything I wanted and take any class I wanted. And... Um, at the, at the final review, this, some very perceptive teachers uh, said that. And I was just blown away because he was right. And so when I, and then I spent another six months drawing, going back to my craft and applying to Mills with my drawings. My drawings were very hard to see. So I really worked hard to get to the teachers at Mills and said, you have to see this in person. I cannot show you a slide. So, and um, some of them were glad that I did uh, because, um, you know, anyway. So you have to do what you have to do. Be brave and just be authentic. Um, and uh, of course that might change, but uh, if you find your calling, you will be okay. You really will. Even if you fail, you will be okay, I think. Um. I think I would, I think I would discourage anyone from, from being a chef. <laughs> uh, if I'm, no, I mean, if, I'm, if I'm really honest. Um, words of advice, I mean, I, I need advice, I, I'm not sure. But, but I think it is a profession that uh, um, you have to uh, pursue only if you think that's the only profession that's for you. Um, if, you have, if you have options, uh, I would really pursue other <laughs> options. But uh, <laughs> is this a comedy routine you're here? <laughs> no, it's just it's just having this moment of pure honesty uh, in front of a bunch of people. Uh, but at the same time, I th I do think that if you're going to be a chef and be happy being one, you have to really love the act of cooking and and feeding someone. Um, and if if you're satisfied with that you always have a job somewhere and you can always provide for yourself, although it will be a challenging, um, a challenging one, it can be a challenging one. But if you um, aspire to be a chef for, for reasons beyond that, I think um, it can be incredibly difficult. Um, so you have to really um, pursue this profession for that pure, um, for that pure act of, of loving to cook and nourish people. I, I can tell you that I, I love what I do, and uh, I know Sam and Rosanna, I think, better than, than, than you, but what they do, you, you're all at the top of your game or what, what it is that you've pursued, and I see great satisfaction with these two ladies uh, in their enterprises, and I'm, I, I believe the same with you, Corey. And my, my only comment or question is, I think that is a possible burden uh, to the next generation to have this satiated, every ever hungry, but obviously in pursuit of further greatness, but you're, you really love what you do and, and you're, you're content with it uh, and you're true to yourself, as you say. Uh, but that's a hard thing to find and there are many people of our age and older and friends who, who do what they do and don't love what they do. Uh, and talking to the, the next generations, pursuing that... Uh, satiation 
uh, is a difficult thing to achieve or even think maybe what it is. Uh, and as you zig or zag on the way there, um, uh, you, you want to be true to yourself. Um, I don't know if technology and, the, and the, 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 the changes of the world continue to influence the, what we do and the, the, the crossover, but the, uh, uh, the final question to all is, would you do anything differently uh, up to this last minute here on the stage? Oh my gosh, I don't know. Um, I love what I do, I'm really satisfied. And I love what you do. I mean, I love design. And I'm also trained as a graphic designer. So uh, industrial design, architecture. Um, so I mean, but I'm uh, so happy with what I'm doing. But Tony, regarding what you were saying, I do think that people come full circle, and if they pay attention to where they came from, to those first, I would say, 10 years of their life, um, the seed is there. The seed is there for, for what really filled you. Um, and, and chances are that will continue to uh, fill you nowadays, as a fulfill you. Um, and I would like to add one more thing. I think that there's some, there's a word in Spanish that kind of um, unifies these three traits here. And the word is sobremesa. And I don't know if you know Spanish, but sobremesa is a specific word that um, refers to the time after your meal where you're sitting at the table talking to your friends, maybe nibbling on the last of their dessert, having your aperitif. Um, digestive, I'm sorry, and um, and it can last for hours. So I think that um, that's where the act of sharing the humanity, the after giving of these professions, kind of comes together at the table when people are talking in, the, in this uh, sobremesa. Oh, sorry. <laughs> is that when you get the bill, Corey, or is that? Uh... <laughs> It might be, yeah, it might be a little hard <laughs> at Bennu. <laughs> um, well, I, I think for me, um, a lot of it would be about just kind of slowing down the process um, and really enjoying that process a little bit more um, because I think that's, that's really what, for me, uh, my profession is about is the actual process of cooking. I mean, whether someone enjoys what you have or someone hates it, you know, it's almost a byproduct of, 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 this, of engaging in this process that, that, um, that you believe in. Um, and I think, I wish I, if I could change something, it's just focusing on that a little more and slowing down. Wonderful. I kind of would concur with Corey. I think that the, the only way you can do thing, things truly well is if your heart's in it and if it, there's an authenticity to it. And... Um, I, I feel like as soon as you kind of lose sight, if you're just sort of on cruise control in terms of what you're doing and it, you are not producing the product, it might, you might be able to coast for a little bit, but you're not producing the product that you want. You're not creating the experience that you hope. You're not having a Hamish moment after a meal. You're not, it's not, you're not making the world something different. And, um, so yeah, slowing down and just saying, okay, I'm, I'm here, I'm doing this thing, and I'm loving it. And if you're not loving it, stop doing it. Well, with all that passion, uh, I think we'll open up the floor to any questions for our panelists. There are some microphones going around. Uh, doll, um, second row. Thank you all. Uh, I have a comment and a question. The comment is uh, to congratulate Rosanna on her fantastic show and uh, at Tony's gallery. So if you haven't seen it, make sure to go and see it because they're like jewels. And congratulations, fantastic show. And the question to Corey is what's the inspiration for the new restaurant that you mentioned earlier? 
Um, so we're, we're working on a new restaurant. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a Korean restaurant. Um, and, you know, I think my, my, my career has kind of come full circle as well, where um, for the first half of my career, it was working in kind of fine dining Western restaurants um, and really kind of learning a cuisine that's so different from the food that I grew up with or that was served in my home. And, and I think this restaurant was really trying to capture um, kind of the, the, the best memories I have from some of those experiences in a very accessible way um, and offering people a way to um, kind of discover that or for people who are, who are familiar with that, kind of remember that. Um, so, so I think um, it relates to a lot of things we talked about today. Anyone else? Shy crowd? <laughs> Hi, Rosanna. Uh, sorry to make you keep talking. But I was really intrigued um, when you mentioned your background in architecture and graphic design and thinking about what was said earlier about Judd's practice in Chinati and your show. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the way you approach installation and the relationship between your work and the architectural environment that you put it in. I, I love any time I can actually work in a specific site. Um, the first time I had the opportunity to do this is, was at UCSF, at Mission Bay, at the Le Correta building, and the, uh, the mural still there. Um, is, and I hope that you can go see it. It's public, and you can enter and see all the artwork in the different buildings in Mission Bay. And, um, uh, I love doing that because it poses a problem as well as uh, uh, I have to relate to the space and, and solve a problem. And in that case, there was this humongously large hallway that was very, very dark. And at the time, the plaza in the middle of uh, that area was very empty. It had no trees. The trees were very tiny. And... Um, and uh, this very dark hallway had a, had a huge window with light at the end and another one in the middle. But so I thought, I really want to bring light here. I want to bring um, trees. I want to bring. So I ended up using the mica for the first time there because it was reflective and it could capture the light from the windows. And, um, and, uh, what I brought, what, uh, the design was actually um, taken from the little architectural trees that you put in, in the, the, the mock-ups for, for trees, so, which I thought were so perfect and beautiful. So I used that as the design. And um, initially I wanted people to be able to walk through it and experience the change in light. But they looked at me and they're like, uh-uh, you know, they were going to put tables against the wall. We can't take care of this mural. It needs to be up there. And so uh, I was very happy when I said, Mama gave me an opportunity uh, to do the mural in the hallway as well, where you could actually walk through and experience a change in light. And um, so, yeah, just solving these problems is really, really fun. Uh, and, of course... Uh, working in the interior of such amazing architect, uh, Mexican architect, I just couldn't be more pleased. Thank you. Anyone else? I was wondering what kind of people it's important to surround yourself with to be able to continue on the sort of um, bespoke visions that you have for yourselves and your lives. I think being able to articulate what you don't like is probably the most important thing. I would hope that fi figuring out what you do like is a ever advancing and lifelong journey. So choosing what doesn't resonate or is not a, a higher aesthetic or an aesthetic which you feel fulfills you is a great way to begin the journey of kind of casting aside the things that are not part of that evolution. And everyone is calibrated differently and what's right for you is not necessarily right for the person next to you and vice versa. So there is no right or wrong. The, the, 
the most, most, most important thing with everyone here talking about their travels and various experiences is the journey. And without seeing or experiencing these things, you have no ability to comment. And so smelling the Agnes Martin painting or trying Corey's soup or visiting Sam's store or Rosanna's drawings is paramount in the kind of evolution of your taste. And hopefully it's a lifelong education. You know, I, I, I kind of don't look at it this way. It's like I wouldn't, I mean, just surround yourself with everybody. You know, that's the best part. Um, my father was a tailor, and I was teeny, and I had all these pieces of fabric on the ground that he would cut the suits and throw on the ground, and I would play with them. So, it, you know, you don't know where your inspiration is going to come from, and I think everything goes. Uh, yeah. I. I'd actually concur with that. I just, I sort of feel like as long as I'm experiencing some sort of effervescence from somebody, I also, I, I, ser I love to laugh. So the more funny people I can have around me, it just, that is really, truly, it helps my creative process. It helps, it helps me walk this walk. And so, yeah, I just, I love being around people who are willing to wonder and feel gracious and happy to be a part of being around. Yeah, I, think it's, um, I think it's important, but to the extent that um, the people are diverse and there's a, a kind of a broad range of, of, of people you interact with and um, that, can, that you can get inspired by or learn from. And you need time to yourself. That's probably the most important. Just, you know, leave, leave time for yourself. Anyone else? Hi, uh, I'm really interested in learning more about the dinner collaboration between Rosanna and Corey. What's your departure point and what's the actual collaboration process like? And do you feel like there are intersection that are beyond the visual language? Well, uh, I think this just started um, with this, basically this opportunity that we have um, of having this space inside the SF moment where we can, um, we can look at that dining experience a little bit differently than you would in a, in a traditional restaurant for, for a variety of reasons. And you know, we talk about um, events that we can host or different programs that we can do there. Um, and this was um, an opportunity to collaborate with someone who's not a trained chef, which is kind of what we, what we do there. Um, and in some ways, I think that was probably one of the most interesting dining experiences that I've seen unfold. Uh, <laughs> well, interesting and, and, and delicious experiences, I think, unfold. Um, and we, we started that, um, that event without an idea of what, it, what we wanted it to be, other than uh, making sure that um, Rosanna was the one leading us, because I think if, if you left it up to the chefs, it would have been like a typical um, uh, dinner. Um, and it was really up to Rosanna, and, and I think she did um, a menu that was was pretty varied um, in that some dishes were kind of memories of something that was very fond from her childhood or fond memory from her childhood. Um, and some were really conceptual dishes and very, very visual. Um, so I mean, it, was, it was a really fun event. Uh, and, the, and, and seeing her studio, um, I think the, the chefs that um, were with me when we went to visit, I mean, everyone was inspired by it. Um, and, and we saw some things immediately that we knew we can incorporate into the menu. So it was, it was very different. It was so much fun. And um, I must start by telling them that when they came to my house to have my dinner, I was terrified. You know, you have these three professional um, chefs coming in, and Jasmine, I'm sorry, Jasmine, um, coming into your house and you realize that everything you've prepared has to be prepared as you speak to them 
And not only that, you're very bad at that, at cooking and talking. So it was, um, but they were so generous with their compliments and their time. And um, um, it, I was blown away. You know, for example, I, blo I was blown away at the craft, at their craft. I had them trying my mother's soup. And they asked me about the ingredients. And I said, well, you know, I normally put, you know, a piece of chicken and some bone marrow and a piece of meat and this and that. And uh, I don't remember if it was Ian. I don't know who said, well, you know, I just don't taste the bone marrow. <laughs> and I was like, that would be because there is no bone marrow in this <laughs> soup. Because I didn't have it. So there's bone, but it's not a marrow. So, you know, I mean, that is just... It's just their palate is incredible. So when you work with people at that caliber, you are just blown away. And the way they interpret um, some of the traditional dishes from Asturias was spectacular. Like a, a blood sausage. Um, I didn't want to say to anybody that it was a blood sausage because I knew that people were not going to eat it. Um, they put it with popcorn, so it would look so pretty, like a popsicle. So everybody <laughs> put the popsicle in their mouth, and I don't know what happened afterwards, but nobody complained. Um, so it was, it was such a joy, really, to work with you um, and see them incorporate parts of my designs into their plates. Uh, what a privilege, really. And they did a great job. And the original dish of Asturias is called fabada. And it, it comes with like uh, some, some bacon and some chorizo and some blood sausage and whatever. And I said, well, you know, you can just contact the providers and just put it together, you know. Or you can, um, uh, what's the name of the uh, chef from Asturias that's doing all this work in Puerto Rico? Jose Andres, who actually grew up next door to me. Um, and so you can contact him and see, you know, who his, his providers are. And oh no, they did it all from scratch. Everything but the beans. So it was incredible. It was such a pleasure. Yeah, I think, so. I think um, certainly there's, there's a lot of conversation around uh, like food and art and where that starts and where that ends these days. But uh, that's a whole different topic. There was this one dish that, that Rosanna did which was, uh, I'm sorry about my pronunciation, is that right? It's the, the fideo. Yeah, it's, Sopa. Yeah, it's, it's like basically a soup. Um, and I think that's one of the most artful, evocative dishes that, I, that I've seen. Um, yeah, the soup, it was just this beautiful, clear broth, crystal clear. Um, and and the only, there was no garnish or anything, and it was just this noodle inside. Um, and it was, it was so striking visually. Um, and then when you hear the story behind it, um, it was so much more meaningful. Um, so, I've, I mean, I've been pretty fortunate to have tried a lot of um, great food around the world, but that, that one really stands out. And it's so funny because it is those simple dishes that are, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the hardest to replicate. Because we were having a hard time replicating the, t the flavor of that one. Um, and, um, and that is a dish that everybody has in Spain. Like, before dinner, before lunch, soup, you know, sopa de fideos. Is this the most ubiquitous dish in Spain? Well, a sincere thanks. Uh, tremendous journey, lots of insight, and, uh, and and some very very good laughs. So thank you. Um, thank you, Danny. Enjoy the rest of your day, all. Thank you.